Merry Christmas. Or should I say Happy New Year, depending on when you're listening to this. Or maybe you listen to this in 2024, in which case it's too late. But anyway, it's Christmas Day. What better way to celebrate than with a special Kaleido pod? And here we are talking about all things space related today, but not science fiction, this time science fact, giving us a small insight into the collection of hollow mission audios that have been found over the years. Now, we have probably a lot, lot, lot more in the collection than ju- just what I'm talking about today, but this is a good taster and enough for one programme. You never know, one day you'll persuade me to do more Kaleido pods. Who knows? So, on this wonderful Christmas day, let's start by looking at the 28th of February 1966, which was when Luna 9 was going to go uh, uh, on a moon landing. And what a good place to start, but with uh, some audio taken from a collection we had from Albury many years ago. Not brilliant audio, I have to say, but this news does not exist anywhere else. So here you are, Luna 9 landing on the moon in 1966. Well, the Russians claim to have achieved a soft landing has galvanised the scientists working in Jodrell Bank's satellite room. They'd been monitoring the moonshot on the basis of a landing shortly after 9 o'clock. Even though the signals from Luna 9 had ceased at 5 minutes past 7, not very much significance had been attached to this. The signals had been coming in loud and clear ever since 25 minutes to 5. When they stopped just after 7, Professor Sir Bernard Lovell told me they'd probably done so on command from the ground. So it came as a big surprise to be, to be told shortly before 8 o'clock that the Russians were claiming a soft landing. At the moment, Jodrell Bank's analysing its records, but it's now known that there was in fact a significant change in the signal note shortly before 7 o'clock in the cutoff. This could well have been the actual landing. And I've just been told by Professor Lovell that everything now points to the retro rockets of Luna 9 being fired at 6.44. A minute and a half later, the probe landed on the moon. The signal then continued for another five and a half minutes. During this time, Professor Lovell believes television pictures of the moon's surface were being transmitted back to Earth. Well, since then, there's been silence. At the moment, said Sir Bernard, we don't know whether Luna 9's transmitter has been switched off intentionally or whether there's been a technical failure in equipment now resting on the moon's surface. It was possible that the Russians had switched off to conserve their batteries. The Bernard's word for it all, historic. In the race for the moon, it puts the Russians ahead of the Americans. That was Tom Heaney. There were many more uh, moon landing missions and Apollo missions in between Luna 9 before we come to Apollo 17, which is where we rest our weary legs today, as it were. The bulk of today's programme is focusing in depth on Apollo 17, and we're going to look at the various things that kind of went on. Now, these programmes were always full of people sitting in studios, normally James Burke and Patrick Moore, talking about what we were seeing on the screen as the pictures came back from NASA. Virtually all of these programmes are wiped or were never recorded at all because tape was so precious. But also, I have to say, they often weren't recorded because they were unannounced. Literally, the Radio Times has no details of many of these programmes because they were just dropped in as things happened. And that's often why they weren't recorded. It's a miracle anyone was recording them on audio, really. Shows the dedication of people sitting at home to do that. Let's start then with Burke and Moore discussing uh, liftoff from Earth, and this is from 1972. Put the problem out, and it's going, the clock is going. Just a few seconds ago, it picked up at the uh, eight-minute mark. Position standing by at the space uh, That will be brought back to the full retract position at uh, approximately T-minus five minutes in the countdown. So they've solved the problem, and we're back to a launch situation. Some, uh, well, almost... Uh, two and a half hours after it was due to go. Apparently what happened, apparently what happened was that the the third stage tank was being filled up with liquid oxygen, which is the one of the two types of fuel it uses, when uh, it wasn't, turned out not to be filling up properly, and so they decided to fill it up manually, and while doing so, the computer somehow got the impression that the lateness of the repressurization that was going on because they had to decide to do it and then actually do it physically. Uh, because of the lateness, the automatic sequence computer uh, said to itself, it's not happening on time and uh, according to its own rules, it cancelled the launch at 30 seconds to go. The crew have been up there now since the hold was declared. 
they're, they're pretty tired. They've been talking about the fact that perhaps they may cut down on some of their activities up in, in, in orbit before they set out for the moon. And uh, NASA uh, has decided to try and go exactly six minutes from now. That swing arm just moving, or just due to move away, the swing arm that connects the astronauts to the gantry. At this time, the various elements of the launch team have been reporting into Bill Schick, the test supervisor, indicating that we are go to continue. Mission Director Chet Lee just verifies that we are go for launch. Mark, T-5, 45, and Gene Cernan made that final guidance alignment. That's the last action taken by the crew aboard the space vehicle. Now approaching the half minute mark. T-33, T-30 seconds, and continuing on now. Continuing on at the T-26 second mark, T-25. We'll get a final guidance uh, release at the T-17 second mark. T-17, final guidance release. We'll expect engine ignition at 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, ignition sequence started. All engines are started. Whoa. We have ignition. 2, 1, 0. We have a liftoff. We have a liftoff, and it's lighting up the areas. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. It has now cleared the tower. And she goes! Okay, it's blinding us here, blinding! Just going up through the speed of sound, no! Right on the line. Everybody says looking great, right on the line. We're now one mile downrange, launch vehicle 4.2 miles high. And that's because you can see that plume 2,000 feet long behind that rocket. Four miles downrange, eight miles high, and the velocity appro approaching 3,000 feet per second. That's great. Well over 1,000 miles an hour now. And up at about 50,000 feet already. Less than a minute to go to the cutoff of the center engine on that first stage. Stand by for mode one, Charlie, Debbie. Mark, mode one, Charlie. And the flight dynamics officer says we look good on all sources, uh, right on the trajectory. Roger, 17, you're go. Ten seconds to go to center engine flight cutoff. Dr. Gene Kranz taking a status for staging. We say we look good for staging. Roger, we're going here. No, it should be. Inboard cutoff. And it's gone, good. Inboard engine shutting down on time as planned. Look at the glow of that thing, up around 30 miles already. At maximum G-forces of about 4 Gs. Uh, Coming up now to separation, 3 seconds. Coming up on first stage shutdown. 3 seconds. And there it goes! And we've had shutdown on time on the first stage. Oh, 5. Roger, they're looking here, look good. Going out across the Atlantic like a star. Roger, Jack. The thread is going all five out there. Running good. Okay, three minutes and we're going. And you'll see the jettison Roger. in the center of the of the interstage skirt come in three seconds. Okay, we do. There she goes. You just saw that flare there. Roger, we confirm skirt depth. And the tower should come away. Ah, right to the tower. You're about to. Roger, about to. You can just see the escape tower falling away. There's a faint dot. The steering has converged. The ZMT is go. You're going right down the pipes, everything. Okay, Bob, I do confirm guidance. That's the automatic guidance system. The inertial guidance system performing properly. Breakers and uh, we've seen it all. Like vision, uh, staging, and tower. Roger, get you. Apollo 17, now 65 miles high. Okay, four minutes, and we're go here, Bob. Roger, Gene, we're going around the room. Look, go here. You're looking real good, Gene. 
right down the line. The tiny flare in the sky there, over 65 miles high, climbing out over the mid-Atlantic. Everything reported well, everything looking good so far. Okay, 430 and we're still going board. Roger, 17, you're go. Let me tell you, this night launch is something to behold. Coming up on five minutes, uh, everything still looks very good in the launch of Apollo 17. The launch vehicle spacecraft now 80 miles high, 230 miles downrange. Well, Patrick, that was your, that was the first launch you've seen. How, how did it feel? Uh, what was it like? Absolutely staggering. It's something that no words can possibly describe. It's got all the glory and the majesty of a natural phenomenon, and somehow it was ten times more than that, simply because it was man-made. And I think the thing that impressed me most, not having seen a launch before, was not only the thunderous noise, but the actual shaking of the ground. We are some way from the rocket, obviously, quite a long way for safety's sake, but all the same, the ground quivered and shook. It was something that gave you, gave you an idea, I think, of the immense power in that rocket. And we're just losing sighting of it now. And it climbs out across the Atlantic with the second stage engines working perfectly at this moment. It looks like a perfect launch finally, and it looks as if they may make it into orbit without a hitch. About three and a half uh, minutes from now. And just look at that pad. S4B to COI capability. Mark, S4B to COI capability. The pad there smoking and steaming as the millions of gallons of water jet all over it to cool it down after the effect of that launch. The launch of the last manned Apollo mission to the moon, possibly this century. Apollo 17 still right on the nominal trajectory. Uh, at an altitude now of about 92 nautical miles. Uh, we got four good motors and we're going 620. Roger, at 17, we copied the gimbals and we watched them, they look good. And with that magnificent launch, as Patrick said, an indescribable physical sensation to be here and see it, but equally a, a tremendous thing to see go up. Now, uh, we, we, we bring our launch program from Cape Kennedy to an end. It's, it's been a tremendously exciting night and a tremendously and satisfying night for everybody here and people. everybody I'm sure in the launch tower and everybody on board the spacecraft. It looks go for an orbit. It looks go for Apollo 17. It looks go for a tremendously successful last journey to the moon. And with that, in the early hours of the morning here at Cape Kennedy, from us at Cape Kennedy, that's it. And here's a news report on the liftoff of Apollo 17. After a dramatic launch, America's last moonshot, Apollo 17, is now speeding on a course to a lunar landing on Monday night. And the crew are having their first sleep after the drama, which began just before 3 o'clock this morning, when it looked as though the mission might have had to be called off. The Saturn rocket was just half a minute from liftoff when it developed a major problem on the launch pad at Cape Kennedy. The engines will build up to a thrust of 7.6 million pounds. T minus 30 seconds. We have a cutoff. We have a cutoff at T minus 30 seconds. A computer had stopped the automatic launch sequence after registering a fault in the rocket. The swing arm, a device for rescuing the astronauts from the top of a rocket, was quickly brought into position. The Saturn was loaded with fuel, which had an explosive potential equivalent to a million tons of TNT, and launch control were trying desperately to find the fault. Eventually they did, and the spectacular night launch began nearly three hours late. Ten, nine, eight, seven, ignition sequence started, all engines are started. We have ignition, two, one, zero, we have a liftoff. We have a liftoff and it's lighting up the areas. It's just like daylight here at Kennedy Space Center as the Saturn V is moving off the pad. It has now cleared the tower. Roger, Gino, looking great, busted on all five engines. Okay, baby, it's looking good. Your roll is complete. We are pitching. Mission Control, Gene Cernan, reporting uh, the launch vehicle, maneuvering to the proper attitude. Everything looking good at this point. 17 is gone. Roger, 17, you're go. Everybody says looking great, right on the line. We're now one mile downrange, launch vehicle 4.2 miles high. Traveling at 5,000 miles an hour, the rocket's first stage is about to stop burning and fall away as the second stage ignites and takes over. 
Inboard engine shutting down on time as planned. Coming up on first stage shutdown. And we've had shutdown on time on the first stage. Five. Roger, they're looking here, look good. Sure felt like it. I think we saw them off from here. Roger, Jack, and the thrust is going, all five of them, they're running good. Okay, three minutes in, we're go. Roger, 17. ...is now 70,000 miles out from Earth. It'll go into moon orbit on Sunday, and on Monday night, the lunar module Challenger will take astronauts Cernan and Schmidt down to the surface to explore the Taurus Littro area for three days. What a fantastic night it has been here at Cape Kennedy, the night of the launch of Apollo 17, the last possibly to till the end of the century. The launch countdown was possibly the most flawless ever. NASA announced that everything was going perfectly even two days ahead of launch. The crew were woken up just before midday local time here at Cape Kennedy. They announced they'd slept well. The launch control room announced that they were, everything was going perfectly at about uh, 15 minutes to go, they were even a little bit ahead. And the time got uh, closer and closer to the moment of launch. The tenth uh, atmosphere obviously built up for this last launch. And then, uh, just a few minutes to go for launch, this happened. First stage propellant tanks have been pressurized. Now past the one minute mark, and we are going on internal power. Now all systems to internal power. We'll be looking for the engine start sequence at the 8.9 second mark in the countdown. The engines will build up to a thrust of 7.6 million pounds. T minus 30 seconds. We have a cutoff. We have a cutoff at T minus 30 seconds. We're standing by at T minus 30 second mark. We'll bring word to you uh, just as soon as we get it. We have a cutoff at T minus 30 seconds. T minus 30 seconds and holding. This is Kennedy Launch Control. And then, just then, as he said, a cut-off, I thought I saw a flash at the bottom of the rocket. Something is wrong. They haven't told us what it is yet. It might be an electrical connection. But there was a flame, a short flame, holding there at 30 seconds to go. Never happened before. This is the first time anything like this has ever happened on a Saturn launch. Still no words from the firing room. No apparent activity, as I can see, out there at the rocket. The fuel is still continuing to boil off. But there was a flash. This is the Apollo Saturn launch control. We're holding at the 30 second mark. This was an automatic cutoff. It's cut off by the terminal sequencer. As mentioned, this sequencer initiates various actions. Each action must take place and must be completed before the next one can be initiated. If anything does not get completed in time, there will be an automatic cutoff. This cutoff was automatic, done by the sequencer. We're standing by now to check just what the problem was. Now, T minus 30 seconds and holding. This is Kennedy launch control. After the first attempt, they began at the second attempt. At 10 minutes to go, this is how it looked. And with 10 minutes to go to the second attempt to launch Apollo 17, the tension and the atmosphere here at Cape Kennedy is quite extraordinary. It's unlike anything that I've ever experienced myself, for one principal reason, and that is that what NASA in the firing room are doing right now is what the Americans call troubleshooting. The problem that caused the delay... Or T minus nine minutes, 36 seconds, and we are counting. However, we do plan to continue the hold at the T minus eight minute mark. We can hold at that point for 20 minutes and plan a 20 minute hold while the launch crew here satisfies themselves that they have worked out a, a good solution and a workaround to the problem. The crew has been alerted aboard the spacecraft Cernan indicated that uh, perhaps they could start a nice conversation about a good book, Thomas Hardy or something like that. Countdown continuing now, aiming toward the uh, eight minute mark at which time we'll hold. T minus nine minutes now, T minus nine minutes and counting. This is Kennedy launch control. So you'll gather there from what uh, Chuck Hollins had said, that the troubleshooting means that in fact they have not discovered what went wrong and they began the count again with uh, a few minutes, uh, few minutes ago, and they're going to run down to the eight-minute mark, and if they haven't solved the problem by then, then they will hold, but continue to work, and then pick it up from eight minutes. 
And until they solve that problem, nobody knows whether Apollo 17 will launch or not. There's 25 seconds to go to that decision. If the computer says everything's okay, then at eight minutes they will go on. If it doesn't, then they'll hold it at eight minutes. Coming up to eight minutes. Oh, for a second there, it went to 7.59 and we thought they'd solved the problem. Holding at eight minutes, waiting for an announcement any second now, they can hold for 20 minutes. A great cry went up from everybody here when that clock went below eight minutes because that looked like they'd solved it. We're now holding at the eight minute mark as planned. The hold at this time is planned for approximately 20 minutes. The crew feels that they have a, that they have a workaround to the problem working around the indication going to the terminal sequencer that the tank has not been pressurized when actually it had been done manually. Uh, they are checking all of their data, however, to ensure that this is the proper method to work around the problem and that this will result in a smooth countdown from here on. Now T minus eight minutes and holding, this is Kennedy Launch Control. As I said before, an absolutely extraordinary situation. What happened is that the top, the third stage of the rocket was not being uh, pressurized properly in an automatic situation, and so the crew took over and did it manually. They actually, they, they actually pressed the buttons themselves. Unfortunately, the computer didn't pick up that information. And so what they're deciding to do now is that if they do go, they will go even though the computer says that pressurization hasn't worked, and they will say to themselves, yes, it has because we've done it. And they will go in that kind of situation. And so the second hold was announced by NASA, the only second hold, to my knowledge, in the history of launching a, a Saturn V rocket from the pad here at Cape Kennedy. And the atmosphere now got extremely tense as it began to look possible that the launch might have to be cancelled tonight. They, at this time, only had two and a half hours or so more in which they could launch the rocket. And the crew sat up there, we must have all, we all felt extremely patiently um, talking about discussing books and uh, passing the time as best they could. Of course, they'd been in there for some time more than they were expecting to be on the pad. Um, they'd had a fairly good uh, day, as I said. Uh, by mid-afternoon, they were eating dinner. The dinner, we're told, was attended by very few uh, personal friends and officials. Um, they were eating the usual steak and, uh, and uh, orange juice and ice cream. There's been a bit of problem about exactly what they eat because the last crew mentioned in a report that has not been published that the food should uh, be changed because of the uh, constraints placed on them in, in space as uh, a question of residue and how much hyper, hi, hi, car, hydrocarbons, uh, rather carbohydrates they'd eaten just before liftoff. But as I say, the dinner, uh, dinner was quite brief. Then uh, after the dinner, they moved in uh, the mid-afternoon to the suiting up, wearing the new suit worn for the first time on Apollo 15, a new flexible suit. The only difference here from any other mission, of course, is that the personal preference kits have changed. There's a small pocket in the, in the uh, suit into which the crew put any pers personal items they want to take up there for people like family and friends. And of course, since the uh, stamp scandal of the 15 crew, when Scott and Irwin and Worden took up a number of... Uh, stamps and had them cancelled on the moon in order to sell them later, the NASA authorities have been very, very tight on that, and so in those pockets, in the suits, there are now only 12 items, 12 items individually very carefully checked. But this particular crew, anyway, are intensely aware of the fact that this mission is the last. They probably had more preparation for the flight than any crew before them, and apart from their training, of course, they've had all the previous missions to learn from. It was finally at 5.33 in the morning, uh, British time, that uh, Apollo 17 finally lifted off. Two hours and 40 minutes after the planned launch time, once NASA had discovered that the original problem in the computer could be circumvented and that the launch could go ahead. Here we go then, when they're talking about the landing. Now, from the BBC Apollo studio in Houston, coverage of the last scheduled landing on the moon. where, as you can see from our countdown clock, it's just seven minutes and just over 20 seconds to go from the moment of ignition that happened at PDI, Powered Descent Initiation, when the main engine of the Apollo 17 lunar module, codenamed Challenger, 
lights up to take Commander Gene Cernan and Lunar Module Pilot Jack Schmidt down to the narrow valley surrounded on all sides by mountains known as the Taurus Littrow site for what may well be the last American landing on the moon until the end of the century. Over the last few days, the flight has gradually made up time, so that although they launched from Cape Kennedy two hours and 40 minutes late, they're now back on schedule. Everything on the flight so far has gone fairly well. I say fairly because they've had a lot of small problems with the computer on board, the uh, master alarm system has been lighting up from time to time for no apparent reason, and there was some trouble yesterday with the latches that kept the two spacecraft together. But one orbit to go, the two spacecraft, America and Challenger, separated successfully, and everything at this moment looks like a go for PDI, Powered Descent Initiation, just 6 minutes and 25 seconds from now. Watching with me here in the studio, BBC commentated throughout the mission, Patrick Moore and Gene Schumacher. Patrick, where does the Apollo 17 flight fit into the entire program? Well, it fits in extremely well, because as far as the Apollo is landing themselves, this is a new part of the moon. The Taurus Litford site is right at the edge of the Mali Serena Taurus. And that's one of the great lunar basins. It's the same kind of structure as the Mari Imbrium, only it's rather smaller and it's almost certainly considerably older. There are two very good reasons why this particular site has been chosen. First, remember that on the moon at the moment we have a chain of scientific stations, those left by Apollos 12, 14, 15 and 16, all of which are still operating, and they are widely spread out and they give a kind of a triangle. But the wider you have your threads of scientific stations, the better the results you get. I mean, there would be no point at all in having two stations close to each other. You want to spread them out. Then you get the best result. And because this new one is going to be considerably farther away from the others, well, you're going to get the best result from it. And that's one very good reason for choosing it. But there is another reason, too. Quite apart from the position, this is a particularly interesting area from the point of view of a lunar geologist. And see, that's where you come in. Yes, Patrick, it's going to be an especially exciting sight for the astronauts as they come in because they're headed right for a rather deep valley, which we can see on this model here, surrounded by mountains rising up to about 7,000 feet on each side. The spacecraft will actually come in over the mountain, landing here about in the middle of the flat floor of the valley, which is about four miles across. Uh, they'll then get out after the landing and go out on this first traverse about a mile or so away after deploying the scientific instrument to sample parts of the material that are on this floor, a unit called a dark mantle, which may contain the youngest rock sampled so far on the moon. Next, they'll go out on a later traverse over toward the base of this mountain called the South Mesite, crossing what may be a landslide coming down from the mountain, and which they'll attempt to sample both pieces in the landslide and the very base of the mountain itself, coming back after about four miles out to return to the spacecraft. Their third EVA will take them to the north, to the base of the North Mesite, where they can again sample rocks from this mountain front and from the base of what are called the sculptured hills over here farther to the east and then returning on about a nine-mile leg back to the spacecraft and coming back the last time to the spacecraft itself. At the moment, we're in the last minute or so to go to, to a power descent initiation. The crew are getting a final instruction. Let's go listening to the air the ground commentary right through BDI. Fuel LH, we've got LH, proceed on the 99. It took two, one, zero, one, two, one, two, two, one, zero. Ignition, ignition, here set. Attitude looks good. Engine override is on, master arm is off. We got a decent quantity light on at ignition. Just a fire ignition. PT, C tank's good. Stand by, there's oh, something left. Last time, Houston. And the computer likes it. Roger. Still got the quantity light on. Perfect thrust up to maximum. Okay, okay. attitude looks good, Jack. Okay, 30 seconds. Should have uh, about 108. Oh, boy. And there, with 11 minutes and 20 seconds to go, it looks as if everything's perfect. The engines, as you heard, are firing successfully, and they're on their way down. Last month, here in Houston, before they went to Cape Kennedy for the launch, I asked Dean Thurland and Jack Smith about what, for both of them now, would be their first landing on the moon, and what promised to be a very difficult site. I mean, that's a very challenging site, let me put it that way. It's surrounded by, uh, by six to seven bad mountains on three sides. It's got a... Uh, a uh, 
on 80 to 100 meter uh, scarp or cliff. Talent to your golf header. Across the front of this canyon that we're landing in between two of the mountains. Uh, probably one of the most, uh, well I'd say difficult, but certainly one of the most necessary parts of, of the landing is to be able to be targeted, have our, have our computer know exactly where it wants to land. And of course we are very dependent upon mission control uh, here for that type of targeting. So there is more than on any other flight, perhaps the, the possibility that you may have to take over and make some very fast decisions down there. Well, certainly when you first see the landing site, uh, if we're anywhere within that, within that uh, Torres Littrell Canyon area, uh, that's the time when I make a decision of where in that area we want to land and hopefully can get back to the nominal landing point. Uh, and uh, those decisions always have to be quick, uh, quick because you don't have much time, you're descending pretty rapidly and uh, you don't have, we don't have the uh, uh, plentiful fuel margin that you'd like to have because of the weight constraints, so we don't have a lot of time. Is there any way that your training set enabled you to, to, to have a feeling for what it will be like when you turn around to the bottom of the ladder? No, I don't think there's any training in the world that would, uh, that would give you uh, uh, an inclination of the feeling uh, that you would have when you, when you step foot on the moon. You can even, I've talked to a lot of other guys, I've talked to John Young, for instance, who's my backup uh, on this flight, and uh, he could have one feeling, uh, but my feeling might be totally different because everyone's an individual, and I know John's feeling back on Apollo 10 when he looked back at the Earth and when he looked back at the moon, and his philosophical or emotional feelings were really quite different than mine were, and I expect mine will be quite different than his when I step foot on the moon. But being the last Apollo of this present series, I will add a different dimension to that too, won't it? I think so. I think probably uh, uh, the first step is going to be all important to me personally, but I think the last steps are probably going to be um, more philosophically important to people here on Earth. Let me just show you what that means. The terrain they're going over, that black line is the approach path, is extremely high and it varies anywhere between 10,000 feet and 1,000 feet. And if you look at the, what are called the computer profile, you see that the computer is programmed to follow that dotted line over each of those tracks as they get closer, and it takes no notice, as it were, of the landing radar information, so that uh, the, the path is smoothed out to the, the, into a sort of general height level, and the spacecraft continues at that general height level, avoiding all the obstacles. And the man down there avoiding many of the obstacles and calling out most of the numbers as we get closer to landing, Gene, is the man you trained as a geologist, Jack Schmidt. How's he doing the filing? Well, I think he's been a terrific job. Uh, he's been pretty clearly heat up and excited about what he sees in space and he's been going out to the moon. Uh, looking back at the Earth, he gave us tremendous descriptions of weather on the Earth and then yesterday as they came into uh, orbit around the moon for the first time and they had a good look at it. We got a very, very good description of the geology uh, from lunar orbit from Jack Smith. But today, of course, they're busy, uh, busy with the task of getting down there, and Jack has been right in there as a pilot, not as a geologist, uh, following the mission down, uh, taking information up from the ground, reading it back out, uh, doing the jobs that are the LEM pilot's job on the spacecraft. And at the moment, we're getting a lot more talk. Let's just listen now from now until touchdown. They're running a little bit high. Back down. Roger, right, good. It's about 30,000 feet there. Electric at 72. Altitude is right on it. H dot is dead close. Okay, 30K, you're on a zero. Throttle down time, 7.26. Height dropping off there. 7.26. Okay, we got everything. We got zero. The mission control displays they're showing them falling hey, slowly towards the surface. 67 Durango, 26, 27, that's great. Well, it's not quite high, but okay. Okay, Gordon, we're going 7, we're now at 25,000 feet. 7 is hey, plus 7 minutes, we're counting down. I'm not going to plane, but I guess we're on target. Okay, what's the throttle out here? Come. Throttling back now. And you should see them curve back. Look at that. Computer liked it. Beautiful. That's it. Hey, 730. Hey, okay, 145 to pitch over, Jack. Okay, 63 is your angle. 
About 56 now. Pitch okay, over. Yeah, the moment at Highgate, about 2 minutes and 40 seconds, where they pitch up vertical and see the landing pad ahead of them for the first time. Each dot major great. Standing by for the camera. I think he's uh, the work all coming up on eight. Okay, the old camera's on, Gordy, believe it or not. How about that? You're at eight, monitor fuel two. Ten miles to go. Fuel two. Twenty-seven, that's good. Come on, baby. Eighteen thousand feet. Thirty, Gino. Okay, I got the south massif. Thousand feet above where they should be. Okay. Uh, update the axe, Houston. Yes. Coming down now about 400 miles an hour. Update the axe. Okay, Gordo, I got Manson, I've got uh, Larry, and I've got the scarf. Five miles to land. They can We're level with the top of the massif now. Badger. Okay, one, five, one, one, five, one, zero. Enter. Okay, uh, Jack, this that one here is going on. Four. Okay, pitch over. Okay, going around 11,000 at 9. Okay, stand by for pitch over. Oh, are we coming in? Oh, baby. Okay, hey. no, 9,000. Stand by for pitch over, Jack. 8,000. I'll beat the pro. I'll give it to you. Pitch over. And proceed it. And there it is, Houston. There's Camelot. Wow. Oh, yeah. Target. I see it. We got them all. 42 degrees, 37 degrees, 2,500, 38 degrees. Bell and Jerry are going for landing. 40, 42 degrees through 4,000, 47 now. 47 degrees through 3,500, 49 degrees. 3,000 feet. 53 degrees. Okay, I've got, for A, I've got Poppy, I've got the triangle. That's 2,500 feet, 52 degrees. Naming all the craters there, you can see. Eight shot is good. It's 2,000. Eight shot is good. Fuel is good. 1,500 feet. 54 degrees, Gene. Approaching 1,000. Dead on the right height. Approaching 1,000 feet. 57 degrees. Okay, you're through 1,000. I'm taking the radar altitude and things altitude degree. You're through 800 feet. Eight shot's a little high. Yeah, I don't need the numbers anymore. Okay, you're 31 feet per second, going down to 500. Going down a little bit far. 25 feet per second to 400. That's a little high, Gino. Okay. 300 feet, 15 feet per second. A little high. Eight shots a little high. Okay, I've got P60. Okay. Okay, nine feet per second down at 200. Going down at five. Going down at five. Going down at ten. I've got the eight shot. The fuel's good. 110 feet. Stand by for some dust. A little forward, Gene. Bend her forward, forward a little. 90 feet. A little forward velocity. 80 feet. Going down at three. Getting a little dust. You're at 460 feet. Going down about two. Very little dust. Very little dust. 40 feet going down at three. Stand by for touchdown. Stand by. 25 feet. Down at two. Feels good. 20 feet. Going down at two. 10 feet. 10 feet. That contact, stop put, engine stop, engine arm, proceed, command override off, boat control, add old things auto. Okay, here's the, the Challenger has landed. Badger Challenger, that's super. Okay, Parker valves. Boy, you better this, Gordo. Boy, when you said shut down, I shut down and we dropped, didn't we? Yes, sir. Well, we is here. And as we hear, how does that look? Pressures, pressures look great. Thank to them just a little bit before. Easy to override his own. Manifold oh, is great. Manifold right on. 
Just go to Jets. Okay, I am Jets. Okay, that's nice, complete. Houston, you can tell America that Challenger and that Taurus Metro. We'll do it. And just eight seconds later than was planned. Great. Brad, I had the big ball all the way. Beautiful. Hey, Decker, we got to have some night bowlers in this area. Okay, the old camera's off. Okay. No information about exactly where they are. Open. Gene and Patrick are watching Second to see water. if they can find out on one of the lunar mission plans exactly where they've landed. And Gordy, that's in tank one. Uh, we started out a little low. It's still a uh, safe place. And what they're waiting for now is the first permission that's to stay. Water. We get two. Uh, one, uh, that everything looks okay. Good. And the second, yes, shut off the engine completely. We're waiting for those two permissions to stay. No description from Jack Schmidt yet. Oh, man, look at that lock out there. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. I think I see the rim of Camelot. All right, the epic moment of my life. Where'd you land? You never let me look outside at all. Hey, you can see the boulder track. Okay, Gordy, we're standing by for your go. We look at, we're looking good on board. That's the go to stay. Okay, go for permission to here. So. Yeah, boulders all over those masses. They've got the initial go. We could have gone all around. It looked around. We've been hovering around a little bit. Come on, look at the sky. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I like it right where we are. Okay, Cordy, while you're uh, while you're waiting on that go, uh, I had to. Uh, I I shot for a spot around two o'clock. The poppy. Uh, there's a number of bowlers uh, out at twelve o'clock from poppy, and uh, I really think I'm probably not more than about a hundred meters out in front of it. And, uh, slightly to the You think we, you know where they are? Uh, where do you think they are, Gene? Well, we can, we can see it right here. Poppy is right on this spot here, and they're just a little bit to the east of it. And they can see Poppy ahead, so they must be about 400 meters east of their designated okay, landing site. over a thousand feet out. Right. Back to the perfect impact. But I tell you, the defeat that near about are two different products. Still not the second mission to stay. But they're different close too. I think you're looking now, uh, probably, that may be Rudolph right there, Jack, out your window. Naming some of the craters around I them. was looking for those boulders that's trying to stay in the spot in between them. Uh, Rudolph uh, right here. Yeah, you they're sitting right here. Right Looks like their designation is right on the money. Just a little bit of a film. You had that. Just in front of Bob. Yeah. Sitting right here. Look at that. And they can see Camelot over here in the distance. Through here. <laughs> okay, Gordy, we're hanging in for your go. Still waiting for the two. Better be a go. Oh, check everything again. Let's just double check. Okay. That hasn't changed. Okay, that's good. Oh, the manifold hasn't changed. Yeah, they're, they're due for permission changed. any second now. That their water has changed. The batteries have a Oh my golly, only we have changed. <laughs> you know, the, uh, you can't see it, the Camelot Jack, that roof is the Camelot out front of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got her. The point I think I'm gonna stay for a key one. They've got it. They've got permission to stay. The first permission to stay. And after an absolutely perfect landing, 1,000 feet from target, and only eight seconds overdue, that's it for the moment from us here in Houston. We'll be on watch, of course, here from now on, and if anything should go wrong, well, we'll bring it to you okay, as soon as we can. We Otherwise, if nothing goes wrong, we'll be back it's tomorrow on BBC that. One at 12 noon with a detailed look at okay, the first moon drive, and then tomorrow okay. evening on okay. midweek with live pictures okay. at the beginning of the second moon okay. drive. And now, at the beginning of this last visit to the moon's surface, possibly for several decades, for a look at where we stand at the moment in the exploration of space, over to London and to Alastair Burnett in the Panorama Studio. Well, Senator and Schmidt safely down there in that steep wall valley on the moon. And they will be the 11th and the 12th men to walk on ground that's not Earth's, to take a small step or two for mankind. As explorers, the 12 have been men of action rather than words. 
They're jet pilots by training. Only one, Schmidt, now is a scientist. Some have had intimations of a religious existence beyond rockets and rocks. Others have shown throughout a cheerful commercialism. And the rest of mankind, acknowledging their bravery and even beginning to pick up their peculiar moon language, has stubbornly refused to admit the stuff of greatness in them. Apart from Armstrong and Aldrin, the first two down, legend and popular attention have attached themselves chiefly to unlucky Apollo 13, the crew that didn't land at all. The names of the others, men of considerable personality and impact on their fellows, Conrad, Lovell, Shepard, Mitchell, evoke among many only sort of stray recollections of jokes and anecdotes half heard over the air. Perhaps it was only heroic deaths and unimagined dangers that turned the old explorers on earth into heroes. Perhaps it was the outrageous tales that they told. And the Apollo crews, with every organ, every movement of wind in the stomach, monitored and recorded by mission control, and almost every step on the moon commissioned in advance, have no mystery left about them. Yet what they've shown is that man can live, move, and work on the moon for short periods, an ungainly figure, breathless, cumbersome, perspiring, even in trouble when he wants to wipe his nose, but still believing that he's taking his first step. Man working with other men, which is at the center of things. I mean, that's how we get the space program, which is just an example, one of the many possible examples of what we can do when we try and pull together. Isn't it true that for each one of us, there is that deep inner yearning to understand what it is we're all about? And to me, that is the essence of the quest of knowledge is to find out what am I and how do I relate to the universe and what is the universe and its relationship to me. In, in, well, the next decade or two will show just where these roads lead, if indeed they do lead anywhere. We live in uh, a, a planet which goes around rather a small sun and a fairly unknown part of the universe. Mathematically, it does seem certain that there must be life of some kind elsewhere. If we were to find life or near life in our own solar system, that might uh, perhaps up the chances considerably. The chances possibly of man going out to seek it if people would not grudge the money. Uh, certainly the chances of their finding us here if they haven't done so already. For well, that's all from Panorama for tonight. Good night. After the nine o'clock news, The Bouncing Boy by John McGrath is the play for today, a story about a second-hand car salesman and his pregnant wife. BBC One. This is the nine o'clock news. There's to be massive government aid for Britain's coal industry, about a thousand million pounds. The Suffolk factory where Mr James Goad works has shut down for a week. Workers there have gone on strike in protest against the fines on the engineering union. In the Argentine, there's still no firm news about the kidnapped British businessman. In Turkey, Timothy Davy gets an extra six months in jail. And Apollo 17's astronauts are on the moon. They'll take a walk just before midnight. Now, Apollo 17 actually saw the, the astronauts drive on the moon. So here's a, a, a bit of conversation about the moon drive. It was here that things began, as they always do on the moon, to get behind time. When they went down the ladder to set up the experiments during the first moon drive, they were already an hour late. The EVA began with getting out the lunar rover, preparing the experiments for deployment, and of course, raising the American flag. This time, the flag was the last one to fly on the surface of the moon. That sort of looks like it's waving in a breeze. It's there. How about right there? It does wave when you do that. We got a beautiful picture of you guys up down there. <sighs> Let me tell you, Bob, this flag is a beautiful picture. You see that? Okay, you're uh, it's partially covering her over, but I get a pretty good shot. How's that? Let me get the focus right. I don't want to put it. There you go. Wait a minute. It's all right, I got you reaching for the flag. How's that? That's very good, Gene. Let me get it stereo. 
It's been, uh, it's beautiful. This has got to be one of the most proud moments of my life, I guarantee you. It was when they'd moved out 300 feet or so to set out the experiment, and they were working on getting a drill core sample out of the ground, that they ran into the first real problem. The problem was getting it out of the ground, and it took both of them to do it. You have to remember also, James, at this point, that they only weigh one-sixth of uh, their weight on the earth, so the force that he's putting into the jack is not nearly as much as he would do it, be doing on the earth. That's why he's throwing himself off the ground like that. Yeah. But everything else went beautifully, and as they left the experiment site, spirits were high, with Jack Schmidt actually bounding musically back to the lunar module. I was rolling on the moon one day, in a very early month of December. Now, hey, 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 the hey, that's right. Hey is the year of the month. When then much to my surprise, a pair of the eyes. Now, we're not where you think we are. We're not sure where we are. Can you get down into that? Well, yes, just, this is uh, the last station of the first moon uh, drive, and EVA 2 is to begin the next day with a long drive to the south. One of the most important parts of the entire trip. Although we still don't know quite what they're going to apply to South Passif to it. Well, we're all speculating it's a landslide, but it may be something totally like, unexpected. That, of course, would be the most exciting find of all. Well, just could be. And it's deep. Well, there you are. All in all, everybody seems to agree, and we've heard that Rishon Katwell feel the same way, that uh, it's been a very successful first moon drive indeed. The crew, as Dave said, is indeed very tired. They said before they got into the lunar module at the end there that this was one time they wouldn't need any exercise period. So at the end of that first moon drive, this analysis of it, that's it from us. We hope to be bringing you the first pictures of the second moon drive live this evening during midweek, and then just after midnight what may turn out to be the most exciting pictures of all, as Gene Fennon and Jack Schmidt attempt to drive up what may be or may not be an avalanche at the foot of the South Massif. So until then, from us here in Mission Control of Houston, goodbye. This is BBC One. Fennon and Jack Schmidt will be woken up from their eight hours of rest by Mission Control within the next few minutes. Then they'll start their preparations for their second exploration of the moon later tonight. David Wilson's been looking at the pictures of their first moonwalk. On this trip, they didn't even switch the TV camera on until they'd finished unloading the lunar module. So the first pictures they showed were of the now traditional flag ceremony. It does wave when you do that. We got a beautiful picture of you guys up down there. Let me tell you, Bob, this flag is a beautiful picture. Dr. Jack Schmidt, the geologist, had the heavy work of carrying the power supply and the transmitting station for the main block of scientific experiments. And you're flopping around like a... How are you doing? Oh, fine. It's just, uh... It's work going out here. Yeah, I bet it is. Just take it easy. I am. I'm going to be a little bit behind you if I have to work on that fender anyway. Meanwhile, Cernan was mending the mudguard of the rover vehicle which they'd broken during unloading. And Dina, how are you doing on that fender? Bob, I am done. If that fender stays on, I'm going to take a picture of it. Because I'd like some sort of mending award. It's not too neat, but uh, tape and lunar dust just don't hang in there together. Talk about seven league boots. Put stem number two on. Schmitz showed the typical moon gallop coming back to the main scientific site after setting out a range of geophones, and eventually he used up too much of his oxygen and water. Apollo 17's landing site, Taurus Littro, is in a rock-strewn valley between 6,000-foot mountains. Despite these landmarks, the astronauts found navigation difficult in their moon rover, and at one time just didn't know where they were. Placing the important neutron probe experiment, they had a terrible struggle to get the drill bit back out from the ground, and Schmidt again overworked in his enthusiastic efforts to help Cernan. They got all their experiments working eventually and returned early to their module, tired but apparently very happy. 
Bop, bop, uh, I was strolling on the moon one day. In a merry, merry month of December. Now, May. May. May is the month. May, that's year. right. May is the year of the month. When they're much to my surprise, a pair of bunny eyes. They're better explorers than singers, so Mission Control reported the first moonwalk a complete success. Well, here at Mission Control, that's how it's been during this second moon drive of Apollo 17. Perhaps the most exciting and rewarding seven hours on the moon since the landings began. With me watching it uh, throughout, Dave Scout, of commander of Apollo 15, Patrick Moore and Gene Shoemaker. The day kicked off for Gene Cernan and Jack Schmidt down there in Taurus Kincher about an hour later than planned, like this. Now, that paper is going to come off and a clamp's not going to come off, I'll say that. I don't know how much we're going to get out of fender, but... Yeah, that's, uh, six, yeah. Let me take a look before I get it too tight. But I tell you, that's going to help some. Yep. They do the trick. I can't see what's under this rail too well, but I know that clamp is on. Uh, it's on tight. Gene, it looks... Let me move this. Move your left hand a little. Okay, tighten that now. Get this up, away. Well, with the fender fixed and the lunar rover packed up, they moved out across to station two. Gene. Yes, we can see the driver's well here, starting in the center of the valley, coming on a long leg, straight drive out, about four and a half miles to the base of the South Massif. We can see that better on the actual Traverse map, and especially the details as they came across past Crater Camelot and Horatio, across the dark mantled valley floor, and then coming to the first of the light mantle material called the thumb, and then on across more light mantle, up across a scarp, the lee scarp, on which they had a little difficulty navigating, and finally on down to the base of the South Massif. They came, uh, Jack Schmidt gave a tremendous description of the geology as they came through this area, and as they came out right on the money here at the plan, station two, let's hear how he's doing. Okay, Houston, uh, the number of blocks plotted on the map are not nearly enough. Uh, in the uh, greater than one meter range, there are uh, many hundred blocks on the uh, flank of, on the mass east flank of Nansen and up around Station 2, where we are. There are only one or two blocks on the light mantle side of Nansen. It looks as if the material in the bottom of Nansen is overriding the uh, light mantle materials of the uh, north wall. That's just an impression. They're slightly uh, lighter albedo than the north wall of Nansen. Jack, that rock is almost got to have come down, don't you think? Oh, no question about it. I bet, uh, you, I bet you it's the same as the blue-gray rocks we see up higher. Here's some more blue-gray ones over here. Let's, uh, let's start taking, oh yeah, look at the, look at the size of some of these light fragments yeah. in here. Yeah, but it's still, I don't, it looks like they're dominantly matrix fractures. There, there are light colored fragments, and uh, they may be crystalline. Okay. Yeah, they are, they're very light colored. They look like the uh, shattered uh, uh, anorthosites. Uh, they have white halos. Uh, I think that's what those fragments are. Well, Gene, what did all that information from Jack Schmidt do to your hypothesis about what the area was supposed to be like? Well, it blew holes in one I hypothesis I was building yesterday, for I had thought that perhaps the large rocks we were seeing as they went towards Station 1 on their first traverse uh, would in fact have been deposits laid down by old landslides before the dark mantle, that, the youngest thing on the valley floor. Uh, and so we were looking to see whether the rocks that came down from the light mantle uh, were like the rocks they had seen, and it turned out they weren't. The light mantle was very, very different. In fact, it had very few big boulders in it at all. And it turned out that the rocks that did come down in the landslide from the South Massif were very different from those on the valley floor. They were bretches and clearly uh, a variety of rocks and much different than the lavas that were being sampled, rather uniform lavas sampled on the valley floor itself. So upturning hypotheses was just the beginning of this particular traverse, and Station 2 indeed continued producing uh, even more extraordinary pictures. You have to start putting some samples in my bag. You're getting a full bag for Christmas here. Is it so full we ought to change it? Yep. Let's do that after we get to the next station now. 
Well, uh, okay. Well, we ought to start moving out of here. Yep, let's go. Let me get one after of the area that we messed up. Beautiful station, guys. Just uh, simply beautiful. Almost deserves a thousand code. Yeah, I'll tell you. <laughs> Falcon 109. Dave, how was the feeling? You've been in Mission Control all day. How was the feeling when Station 2 finished? That was quite a place, wasn't it? Yes, it certainly was, James. And I think uh, after the uh, crew had finished with Station 2, there was sort of a, a mixed feeling of elation and confidence. Uh, confidence because they had, in fact, reached Station 2, which many felt uh, they would not be able to reach because of its distance and the terrain. And elation because, uh, really, they completed all the tasks at Station 2 in a uh, very fine manner and uh, set out for Station 3 with... Uh, many fine samples and, of course, as we will see, uh, even uh, expectations for better things. The Lunar Rover had worked exceedingly well, hadn't it? Yes, it had. As usual, uh, it's a superior machine and it performs uh, even better than we hope each time. Yes, indeed. Patrick, what was your particular reaction to, to, to Station 2? Well, as Dave said, the first thing that we had, my reaction was the fact that they had actually got there, because I hope there was quite a bit of doubt about this. And as Dean has said, it's overturned quite a lot of theories. It has turned out, I think, to be even more interesting geologically than, than was expected. And so it's just as well they did get exactly where they meant to go. Yes, indeed. Uh, Gene, have you anything to add apart from the fact that you changed the hypothesis? Well, indeed, much more, yes. I think Station 2 will be one of the highlights of the mission. Uh, from the descriptions that we got, especially from Jack Schmidt, at, at this station, we can be very confident that the Ma South Massif, which they were sampling, essentially, consists of wretches, of broken rock, uh, composed of debris thrown out in the violent events, the impact events, which have made the large basin, probably the large event that made Mare Serenitatis. It was, uh, and so, so at this point, they then moved out to Station 3, and you've got an EVA map, a moon right. map. This is, this is, in fact, this copy of the map that they carry with them on the moon, uh, they were right down here, and this, this is the very edge of the valley against the South Massif, and they were parked at the edge of the crater Nansen, which has been partly filled with debris coming down from the South Massif. See the boulder uh, halfway up the hill. Yeah, or not halfway, just enough. Yeah, the boulder tracks, they're beautiful. It's sitting right there on the end of the track. There are tracks all over that hillside. There's the boulder came right down to the surface there. See it? Yep. That one, right through that little crater. Yep, sit there for its sample. Look at it. Yes, sir. I'll bet the uh, bare mountain and the sculptured hills are the same. Yeah, they, uh, well, the slopes there, Brent, we'll have to look at it from outside. You may be right. Now I see why they call them sculptured. I got, they're so hummocky that there's shadows all over them. Yeah. God, there's some holes and rocks around here. Well, they do sound fine, and we'll leave them chatting away merrily there. It was Norman Mailer uh, about the first flight uh, there of Apollo 11 who said that the moon was Earth's grey widow. And uh, we've just been hearing from our two scientists that uh, people still dispute what the real origin of the moon has been. Most probably a cloud of gas in our part of the solar system, though other people go on to say it's probably a weak twin of Mercury, and we may just fortunately have picked it up. But our own planet remains something special. The blue planet that uh, astronauts see as they return to Earth from the moon. And as they see it, they become, it seems, almost more romantic about the Earth, more attached to it and to its problems. And it does look as if the very space program itself now, as it goes on, will mean that man's eyes are going to be focused on the most attractive part of the heavens for him here on Earth for the foreseeable future. In the monitor here at the control center at Houston, uh, this means pictures which we've been expecting of the astronauts on the moon haven't yet come through. They've got a little behind schedule, so we shan't be able to show them in midweek after all. But there's going to be a special program at midnight, starting at midnight, of the end of this lunar drive and of the third and last drives it is of this last moon mission. So that's BBC One. Well, from us here, it's good night. We will be back again. Now on BBC One, as mentioned earlier, further coverage of the moonwalk. The commentator is James Burke. Oh, it looks like uh, someone's been chipping up there. That's yeah, it looks like there's been a geologist here before us. Uh, Let me uh, we'll get to a moment. I think I can get some of these pieces over here. I want to get that 90 degree angular flight line around this. Good evening. Point. Welcome back to the BBC Space Studio at Houston, where, as you can see, we're watching the. Uh, the latest set of pictures from the moon on the last moon drive of Apollo 17. They've come out about four and a half miles north of the lunar module and they're right up against the 9,000 foot high mountain known as North Massif. 
and they have been in the last few minutes looking at some of the most extraordinarily large rocks that I think we've seen on any on any broadcast back from the Lena Circuit. I'll get a locator from here. Okay. I was going to get my down but I found it. You may be the outside if you yeah. do. We'll get some. You get it? Yeah, will I come off? Three. Watching with me, of course, as always, uh, Patrick Moore, yeah. here in the studio, yeah. after yeah. John, Gene Schumacher. It's uh, broken, but it's in place. That's a nice big piece, too. That's about the size of a... Why don't you put it in mine? I can't get it okay. okay. We're looking right up to the top of North Mafeet, and then down. Don't move. Okay, Bob, uh, there's a big small line on the ground here. The swamp is so steep, the camera itself right is rolled over it in about 20 degrees. The look at this, the south half of this boulder, the more heterogeneous and texture it looks. Uh, it looks as if it may be uh, either a recrystallized uh, breccia of some kind, or you had a... Uh, uh, yeah, boy, can I decide the magma catch up an awful lot of inclusion. I guess I prefer the latter explanation. Because of the extreme particularity of the Look, he's standing on, it's high on the left and low on the right, as he's leaning back into it. Now, some of the, a few of the inclusions are, uh, well, they're all sub-rounded to round it, and a few, a few of them are very light-colored. I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm, coming get, I'm coming around a corner with a flashlight. Are you going to do it yeah. now? Okay. Yeah, I got Well, that. you know, I ought to get one shot back here with a black and white. I'll get this half black and white. Okay. We, we move across the uh, scene, that barren scene up at the base of the 9,000 foot high mountain north of the along which they will be traveling in just a few minutes. That's it from us in Mission Control at Houston. We'll be back with more of these pictures of the last moon drive. The last moon pictures, incidentally, that we may perhaps see for a generation. We'll be back with those pictures in our highlights program at midday tomorrow when we'll be reviewing the entire third moon drive. That's BBT One midday tomorrow. So from us here in Houston, in the meantime, good night. And a reminder now that Radio 2 is on the air from now until 4 o'clock covering the moonwalk and uh, perhaps stimulated by some of those remarkable pictures we've just seen, you might wish to phone in and ask Captain Ed Mitchell a question between now and 2 a.m. You should phone 01, that's if you're outside London, 580-4411. That's 580-4411 between now and 2 a.m. And just over an hour ago, astronauts Cernan and Schmidt woke up and are now making their final preparations for the liftoff from the Moon, which is due in just about three hours' time. Throughout the scientific exploration earlier today, they were clearly aware of the approaching end of the Apollo program. David Wilson was watching the pictures of Cernan and Schmidt on their last moon walk. Geology was their principal objective as they examined an enormous boulder on the steeply sloping side of the North Massif mountain. Put these in my bag. Inclusions in it, all right. But the whole thing seems to be pretty well altered or meta metamorphosed. Are you ready for this? I'm not sure I am, but go ahead. The one and only scientist astronaut, Jack Schmidt, showed he was also the George Best of the moon. Oh, roll. Look, I would roll on his slope. Why don't you? The commander, Gene Cernan, operated the big 500mm lens camera. But by now they were getting a little weary and they'd found nothing as exciting as yesterday's orange soil. Schmidt was still geologizing keenly and got right down to ground level to study a particularly interesting rock. Tired but still happy was the note. Biddy up and over hill, Lindale. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. They were very much aware that they're probably the last humans on the moon this century, and they left a plaque on the surface. Our new man completed his first exploration of the moon. December 1972 A.D. May the spirit of peace 
in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. It's signed Eugene A. Thurman, Arnold E. Evans, Harrison H. Smith, and most prominently, Richard M. Nixon, President of the United States of America. Back in the command module, Cernan spoke an epitaph for Apollo. We leave the moon and Taurus literal. We leave as we came, and God willing, as we shall return. With peace and hope for all mankind. God speed the crew of Apollo 17. Once they completed the mission on the moon, of course they were going to come back. Of course they were. So here's a little insight into lifting off from the moon. On BBC One Now, tonight's edition of Midweek. Goodbye. Wipe the tear, baby dear, from your eye. Though it's hard to part, I know. I'll be tickled to death to go. Don't cry. Don't sigh. There's a silver lining in the sky. Good evening. Well, In the Name of God is the title of a remarkable film about life in Belfast made by people who live there, which we'll be showing you later in the program. But first of all, the Moon Men. In a few minutes, as I've just been seeing in my monitor here, they're due to start back from the moon. They've just switched on their TV camera, so let's look now at these pictures and join James Burke at Mission Control Houston in the countdown for the last blast off. And on the countdown clock in our mission control studio here in Houston, you can see that there are just five minutes and 45 seconds to go to a moment that not more than three brief years ago, nobody believed would have come so soon, indeed at all. A moment when two American astronauts will leave the surface of the moon and nobody goes back, perhaps for a generation. That lift off to bring Gene Cernan and Jack Smith up to orbit on board Challenger and back to the safety of the mothership America takes place just before five minutes to the hour. Watching in the studio with me here through this last liftoff of all, as they have watched through the mission, Gene Shoemaker, Patrick Moore, and astronaut Dave Scott. Dave, how did it feel to have dedicated a considerable part of your life, and some people might say risked your life several times, for this adventure to see Apollo in like this this soon? Well, I have to put it in the context of the overall adventure that we've had, James. I don't see that this is necessarily the end of Apollo. I really think this is a, the beginning of a period of exploration which will see many fascinating things in the future and a, and a progress which people can't even understand today. You know, I, uh, I look at the, the limb sitting peacefully there on the surface about ready to leave for the last of the Apollo flights, and I can't help but think of uh, Columbus and the fact that uh, in the space age we're really, you might say, post-Columbian in our development We've discovered that the, uh, the world isn't flat after all, but uh, Cabot and Magellan haven't made their voyages and the Pilgrims haven't even been born. So I think we can see uh, something uh, in the future that's really remarkable. But for you, it's more important to have made this step than actually to worry about continuing at this moment. I think it's important to worry about both. To me, it's been a great 
satisfaction to have been a small part of a great adventure. And I think uh, I worry about the future and the fact that I hope that I can contribute to something that's even more uh, beneficial to mankind as we explore into the future. Do you think it's just been a matter of the American taxpayer deciding to put his money elsewhere? No, no, I think it's been a matter of uh, evaluating our steps and our procedures and saying uh, we've explored the moon, we have a, a good basis for understanding the science of the moon and, and the development of planetary bodies, and now it's time to go on to something else. I think what, from the, what happens to the scientific community that's been gathered together now for this, for this past 10 years? I certainly don't think it breaks up, unless again, put a poll of it in context. We've come an amazing way in three years, as Dave has said, and I certainly wouldn't agree with you, Dave, as your part of this has been a small one, it's anything but that, as we know. But we've got to look at Apollo as part of a general whole. We've learned a great deal, not many from them, and the result is we have now got a whole new crop of problems to face, and we didn't know existed, and this has got to be met in the future, but it could not have been done without the work of the present Apollo team. So this is, as has been said, it's the end of one particular phase in the exploration of space, it is the start of a new one, and I'm sure it's going to be even more exciting, and that is progress. Keen, is it bothering you that this is the last pile of rocks coming back from the moon for the foreseeable future? Well, I, of course, would like to see more, but I think the importance of the Apollo mission, as Dave and Patrick both indicated, goes far beyond up the moon and the rocks from the moon. It's really a venture in the human spirit, and I'm sure we're going to continue. This is the first step, and I, I am certain as I sit here that we're going to continue this because man has to look beyond himself and to go on out and make the farther steps and meet those challenges that are there before him. But you've said before that America has never done quite something like this before to turn it back. Well, I think that they're turning inward now, but America, if it's going to remain great, has got to look beyond itself at this stage. And we may be looking inward for a little while, but I think we'll come back to it in the near future, I hope. Well, let's listen now to the crew on board the lunar module, sitting, as Dave said, so peacefully there on the surface of the Taurus Citra site, just okay. one minute and 45 seconds from liftoff. Our watch is reset. Dave, you got 367. You want to pick up the camera just before I hit abort stage. Coming up on one minute, and we look good. One minute, coming up, Gene. Take your final look at the Valley of Taurus Mitchell. Up from orbit. Okay, one minute, Houston. We're 50 seconds now, and we're go. Uh, yeah, you're looking good here. Camera's not going to run. Without me holding it. 15 seconds. The okay, average D, 20 seconds. Ah, uh, shoot. Okay, okay, let's get off and get the camera. Okay, 10 seconds. Ten seconds. Four stage. Push. Engine arm is that. Okay, I'm going to get the pro. 99. Proceed it. 3, 2, 1. Ignition. Right that way, Houston. That's your good. Axe side. Good over. over. Uh, here you have good front. Well, they seem to be fairly safely on their way up there, about three quarters of the way there. How do you think it went? You've done it before, Dave. I think it's going very well so far, James. I think uh, the liftoff looked absolutely nominal, and uh, they're on their way to one of the nicest rides they'll ever have. That's, uh, that's uh, quite a pit over there. We saw it actually happen as they curve away over the site. Yeah, it's the object of that is to clear all the terrain vertically, and then pitch over and fly into orbit, much like an airplane climbs out to altitude. Because there were some lines, of course, by the mountain there. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. How do you think it went, Patrick? What's your Oh, magnificent, later, because I always have a sense of relief as an onlooker watching these apollos when the engine actually fires. Because either it works or it doesn't. If it doesn't fire, you know, it gets back. And so when looking back at launch, it seemed to be the rather less obvious power to take me to the world when you took off, Dave. That may have been imagination. They didn't know. You're starting to fly all over the place much more. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, it could be the distance the television camera is from the limb, too. I'll tell you one other thing that strikes me, too. It's really quite fascinating to see the bottom part of the limb less than on the moon, and there's now an operating camera sending back live pictures from a world upon which there is now no living thing, and where no living thing will probably go for the next couple of decades, and to me that really is rather incredible. 
You know, James, uh, following up Patrick's thought, I'm, I can't help but feel a little wistful that we didn't have that rover automated. We could have, we came that close. Uh, with the power left to drive that vehicle on and do a little further exploration. Uh, but, but that possibility is passed now, but we do have a very important live remote geophysical station on the moon, and that's an important thing. Let's just go back now and listen with mission control that you can see there for the confirmation that uh, Challenger and Jules and Jack Smith are safely into orbit. Well, what ahead now, Dave? They've managed that perfectly. They've got now to look ahead to the rendezvous sequence. That takes quite a while. Uh, 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 no, not really, James. Uh, it's uh, what we call an M equal one, which means uh, rendezvous in the first revolution after liftoff, which is much shorter than it used to be. We used to go two to three revolutions, and uh, through our experience, we've learned that we're capable of making, as we call it now, a direct rendezvous. And in less than one revolution, they'll be joined with the uh, command module. In less than two hours, that would be. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Well, all I can say is that apart from that early delay on the initial blast off from Cape Kennedy, this is probably been the most trouble free of all the Apollo's uh, series so far, and let's hope it ends that way, I'm sure it will. I think they're going to be some happy guys when they get back together and uh, make that rendezvous, and, and Evans has a chance to rejoin with uh, Cernan and Schmidt. I'd like to be there to witness that joining. What's it like when you get up uh, there and you see the mothership and you know that you have you know, just a few feet to go? Well, naturally, it's quite comforting to know that you're back to your temporary home anyway. And uh, it's just great to see it. It's a spectacular sight, of course, but at this stage of the game, having completed all their chores on the surface, why, they're elated and uh, extremely happy about the whole mission and uh, ready to join with Ron and maybe discuss a few of the things that have been going on for the last three days. Everybody's been grinning to live with it. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we look forward to that in less than two hours, as Dave Scott says, when the rendezvous maneuver is completed and they finally dock with the mothership. So with Challenger successfully in orbit, let me hand you back now to Ludovic Kennedy in London. Well, however many times one sees the moon, it's however blase one gets about it, it's still for me anyway, a thrilling moment to watch the lunar module take off like that, and uh, I must say the, the pictures we've seen this time are, are really, I think, startling and incredible. Uh, there will be, by the way, uh, and I'll mention this again later, there will be a special moon program at midnight. Now, there's a bit of distortion on this recording, but this was the, the kind of charting the progress, if you like, of the return to Earth of Apollo 17. I'm sorry to interrupt the football match at this moment, but right here in Houston, right now, we hear that the pictures of the actual docking between Challenger and America are due at any second. So let's go back and watch Mission Control. We've heard from the crew that they're getting very close in now, and so we should expect Ron Evan to turn the television camera on once more to record the moment of docking. What happens, of course, if they don't manage to do the hard dock? is that they cannot then remove the probe when they can hatch it and climb through. And so what they'd have to do would be to go outside the moon module and spacewalk across to the command module. And that was five oh, you know, the one from Apollo 9, a couple of years But it's a long haul, especially with all the samples. Okay. It's a lot of samples that have been across too, Gene, isn't it? Gene, 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 but they want to get every bit of it if they can. About 40 pounds of the weight, I believe they do. That's right. The trouble is that there are many packages can break. Well, all one big bag. Don't try it again. Okay, she's looking good. Let's go to free. We'll go to retract one. Okay, mark it. I'm free. Okay, retract. Here you come. What do we need? Retracting the probe. Pulling the rubber module in. Bang! I got all uh, two rubber balls. You got what? Okay, okay. <laughs> two grays. I mean, that's better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> better. Okay, it sounded good in here. Yeah, it sounded good in here. Okay, Houston, we're hard dock. Okay, so it's fire. They're coming. They're hard dock. Back here, I understand. Two grays. Second bridge is open. And they've done it so they won't have to come out of the fence belt in Gene when all that rock, and yeah, they're going to bring back really quite a pile. Well, I think that we've seen by far the most successful Apollo mission of them all, James. And I've been particularly proud of Jack Schmidt, the first scientist in the space, 
joining in that crew, doing a very good job. And I think, in fact, setting a fan on a pace for the kind of scientific work in space for years to come. But Kitty, I suppose, you did this in the last one called that after generation, but they will have a laid down mission rule and ideas that maybe another man won't pick up again for 20 years. Well, we hope that some of these will carry on over into the Earth orbital mission, that some of their style of using a mixed crew and scientists, which is going to be coming up now at the Skylab and on into the uh, shuttle program. Patrick, it's been a very successful mission to reopen the ETA. It has indeed. This really has been the key to the sequence, and I think both the equipment and the bomb will have to have the full method of the whole thing. And you know, James, I think that during the last few days, we here in Mission Control have been watching something that's never going to be forgotten as long as history lasts. And with that, with that successful docking, rendezvous docking of the two spacecraft, we leave you here at the uh, BBC Space Studio in Houston. We'll be back on the air tomorrow on BBC One at 2.15, BBC One at 2.15, with mission highlight of the last Apollo mission to the moon. So with that, good night. And also, what about an extra programme on Sunday morning at about 11.35 on BBC One? There'll be a repeat of the programme shown before the blast-off of the Apollo 17 mission called The End of the Beginning, in which James Burke tells the story of America's manned exploration of space in a film which shows the successes and failures and tells why probably this will be the last time man goes to the moon this century. And, of course, next Tuesday at 7 o'clock in the evening, there'll be coverage of Splashdown, live colour television from the Apollo 17 recovery ship Ticonderoga, waiting in the South Pacific for the return of the last Apollo. A programme introduced again by James Burke begins at 7 o'clock in the evening next Tuesday on BBC One. And by the way, uh, the programme tomorrow, uh, James Burke should have said 1.45. That's 1.45 tomorrow on BBC One. Last night's blast-off from the moon's surface was a perfect one, and it was only later that snags arose. The LEM soared up to meet the command module, and the pair made a perfect rendezvous with a sparkle of light as the lunar craft fired its rockets to manoeuvre. But docking the two craft was completed only after a long delay, and at the second attempt. Then a second setback. The lunar module was dropped back onto the moon, aimed to fall near a camera left to record the crash. But it fell nine miles off target and out of sight. But Mission Control said that this was just an extra goodie lost in what had otherwise been a highly successful moon landing. Now, The Last Apollo, live coverage of the splashdown of Apollo 17 in the South Pacific, introduced by James Burke. aim for just a very shallow angle uh, coming in and kind of hit it at a glancing blow uh, and you have to hit this uh, what we call an entry angle uh, within about one degree and from 250,000 miles away uh, it's fantastic to, uh, that you can get down there. If your hand are too shallow uh, you skip out and go around for a long long time and you don't make it home for Christmas that's for sure. Uh, if you get too steep uh, the uh, spacecraft cannot stand the, uh, the frictional heat that, is, uh, that develops a spacecraft and it conceivably uh, could burn up. Welcome to the Apollo Space Studio and the BBC for the last time. With me here, Jeffrey Pardo, as we wait for the homecoming of Apollo 17 and the return to Earth of the last men to visit the moon for perhaps a generation. A few minutes ago, about 2,000 miles out from Earth, we heard that the command module had separated successfully from the service module. The crew swung the command module, as ever, heat shield forward, rolled her so that she was heads down, and they're in that position now, coming in at 24,500 miles an hour, head down, backwards, for the last splashdown of all. The last report we heard from NASA that was that so far everything seems to be going well. They're exactly on the entry angle that they have to aim for in order to hit the 
atmosphere correctly. As you heard Gene Cernan say there at the beginning, if they missed that angle, they'd skip back out into space. It doesn't look as if that's going to happen. Earlier today, there was a final mid-course to put them, as NASA would say, right on the money. And so they're heading on in. And if I can show you here with this, uh, and you can see the carrier there waiting as we are for them. Radar scanning the sky. The first pickup, of course, will be from the Araya aircraft flying several thousand miles away, used as a relay staging post for communications. Waiting to hear for last instructions as the crew come into the atmosphere. The last words that were, were said were that everything was going according to plan. He's to be advised that uh, hydrogen tanks uh, one and two uh, still seem to be with us. We're exactly at the gauge readings uh, above 200 PSI. Roger. We'll run that one through ECOM. <laughs> and the crew there seem to be in remarkably good shape as they come in for a rather unusual landing track. Because of the relative positions of the Sun and the Moon at this particular time of year, and the position in which they left lunar orbit, they'll be coming in over the Earth in uh, a sweep that will take them right across North America and right across the Pacific and finally out over Siberia and China. And then they will catch up and begin to move faster than the rotational speed of the Earth. And even as it turns, they will swing down over the Pacific, heading for splashdown here, about 350 miles south of Samoa. And if I can show you on one of the NASA tracks themselves, over here you can see that track. Entry begins at 400,000 feet here, and then 1,200 miles later, they hit the target point where the ship Ticonderoga, which you saw, is waiting for them, surrounded by helicopters, just up here before the point where they exit the blackout, this part. This whole area is uh, where they're out of radio contact. Here there is a standby aircraft waiting in, to, in case they have to come down early. And there is radio blackout. As you heard it for the first time ever in my experience, you actually heard the radio blackout that happens just 17 seconds after they enter. This is the really crucial time for the crew now, out of radio contact on their own, slowing down from over 24,000 miles an hour. I talked to the commander, Gene Cernan, about how he thought re-entry would be before he left in Houston. And as you slowly start nibbling at the very fine uh, uh, pieces of the atmosphere that are very, very high, 200 to 300,000 feet, you feel very slow acceleration forces. Uh, and the spacecraft starts to decelerate very, very slowly, and our G-forces uh, uh, build up from just a, a half of one-tenth of a G on up to, to close to seven, seven Gs, seven times the force of gravity. And during this period of time, the air gets thicker and more dense, and it, it, it's enveloping the spacecraft, and it's very hot. It's so hot, as a matter of fact, that most of this air ionizes and burns up. And when you're, uh, you're looking out that window, you're you're in a, field, in, in, in a center uh, of a, a beautiful, beautiful purple and purple-white flame that totally evolves a spacecraft. And you could look, it feels like you can look for many, many miles back up into the apex of that flame, and you're down at the bottom of it and looking back, and it, it's like a shell around you. And it's really pretty spectacular. And it, it's like, if you can imagine what it like, uh, would be to be on the inside of a meteor, I guess that's probably what it what it would look like. You're on the inside looking out. And this lasts for several minutes, and then uh, once you get slow enough, uh, the, uh, the heat, of course, uh, decreases, and you don't see that glow anymore. And then you come uh, hurtling down through the uh, uh, upper part of our atmosphere, uh, 50, 60, 80, 100,000 feet, and then you get set and get prepared for, for uh, probably the most beautiful sight in all of space flight, and that's the parachutes. Cernan felt that being involved in the last mission of all put what he was doing into much broader context than just going to the moon to pick up rocks and come back. As he said, it was a matter of having considerable well, privilege. Given a privilege of being a quarter million miles away from our Earth, from home, from humanity as you know it, and you can look back uh, and you can see the beauty and the perfectness and the logicness uh, to, uh, to what... Uh, what we call home, and to, to what we understand as mankind. You, you have to stop and think about where you are, and you have to stop and think about how it all came about. You, you sort of certainly have to admit to yourself that there's someone bigger than you and someone bigger than me 
behind it all because it's too beautiful and it's too perfect to have happened by accident. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's got a purpose. The Earth is not moving aimlessly through the infinity of space and time. It's moving with a purpose. You're part of that purpose, and you know the people back there are part of that purpose. We're a very small ship in this ocean that we call space, uh, and you'd like to think that someday maybe we can all get together and uh, put our efforts forth and press out into that ocean even further than the moon. And we wait now to hear them come out of the radio blackout to hear if everything has gone all right. Let's listen now to hear the first message from the spacecraft. Still no news yet. Probably a skin track of the spacecraft on the ship's radar. Reappeared from blackout, I should say. We were waiting for a call from the space from the uh, Capcom. That's the voice of Mission Control at Houston speaking there, Terry White. Coming down now at about 10,000 miles an hour. That's it. That's them. They're guiding themselves down. You can hear them talking. You can hear them guiding themselves down and talking about it as they come. Just under 30 seconds to the first parachutes. Their computer is telling them they're 1.8 miles short of the target. There go the drones. We've got the drone shoots out. 13,000 feet. Waiting for the main parachutes to open up. They've got the mains, they've got the main parachutes. down in the space of 13 minutes from 24,000 miles an hour to their present speed of 22 miles an hour. At clouds about 3,000 feet, they should be breaking through it. Jack Schmidt reading out the position there on their computer. The, 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 the computer tells them exactly where they are on the surface at 1,000 feet to go. Here they come. Splash. Right below the photo helicopter. Great deal of cheering going on here in the control center uh, as the splashdown was watched in real time from the recovery helicopter. It marked the time at 304.31 ground elapsed time even. What a remarkable series of splashdowns these have been, including, as Jeffrey said, the last one that came down with two out of the three chutes working. Oh, and all the Apollos, Jeff, I don't think has been more than, what, two miles out? No, they've been exceptionally good. And uh, whilst one, of course, knows they're going to work, there's always something that could go wrong, engineering-wise. And uh, the fact that they've been so reliable is really such a remarkable achievement. And you may have heard Gene Cernan a few minutes ago there saying, stable one and the crew is go. That means that the spacecraft has landed the right way up and that the crew are in good shape. And you can hear them, in fact, laughing from time to time. The one man, of course, who wasn't here with us tonight and who has been with us for the last four years watching every moment of these missions is Patrick Moore. He couldn't be with us. He's out of London at the moment, but he's in contact with us and has been watching everything that's gone on. 
How do you feel about how it's gone, Patrick? Well, James, all I can say is that this appears to be a perfect end to a virtually perfect mission. I don't think there's any doubt at all that Apollo 17 has been the most valuable scientifically of all the Apollos. But as I remember saying as we waited for them to blast off, it's been more scientifically useful than the others because it's drawn on the information that the other Apollos have sent. And I think at this moment, as we watch that capsule bobbing about there in the ocean, we might just pause for a moment to take a long, hard look at what Apollo has done. Because, obviously, it's done a great deal more than simply send men to the moon. We've heard a certain amount of criticism as to, is it all worth it just to bring moon rocks back? Well, frankly, this is simply stupid. Because Apollo has told us not only more about the moon, it's told us more about science in general, it's increased the store of human knowledge immeasurably. And it has been, undoubtedly, the greatest venture ever attempted so far by mankind. And when I say that, I don't mean only the men who have flown these Apollo missions. They've done magnificently, this we know, and certainly this last crew of the Apollo 17 has done as much as any. But we've also got to remember the men who planned Apollo and who did the actual building of the spacecraft, and all those people we saw down at Mission Control over the past week. Without them, there must inevitably have been disaster. But as we know, there have been no disasters, and there's only been one mishap. And future space programs couldn't possibly get off the ground without what Apollo has told us. And after all, what's going to come next? Well, Skylab, the American space station. That's going to be launched later on, well, next spring. And if all goes well there, the way to the moon base is open. And once we do get a base on the moon, the benefits to humanity are going to be immeasurable. Of this, there's no doubt at all. But it could not have been done without this Apollo program, which, Andre, has been the greatest triumph of the human spirit. And so, as I say, as we watch that spacecraft, having come, having come back from the moon and brought back the last men on the moon for the time being, I think now this is the moment to pay tribute to everybody who has made it possible. And uh, I am quite sure that at the moment, Cernan, Schmidt and Evans can't fail to be pleased with their efforts, but it has been a team effort all the way through. And so, for the moment, the last men on the moon are home. But, as I believe somebody once said, this is not the end. This is merely the start of a new phase. And so, James, I think we'll all join in saying salute to Apollo. Thank you. Patrick Moore there. And there they are, back on the deck at the end of Apollo. You may have thought it a great adventure, or as Patrick mentioned, you may have thought it a waste of money. But whatever you may have thought, Splashdown brought us to the end of a period in our lives that will never happen again. Even if they do pick out and go up, back out into deep space, and one day perhaps they will, we're the ones who have lived through these years of history, years when for a brief moment man saw himself perhaps for the first time as he really is, thanks to astronauts like these, alone on a tiny, fragile world with nowhere to go eventually, but out there back into deep space. One day, perhaps in our lifetime, he will go. Till then, we can remember these pictures and remember these four years, the four years that end tonight. So, from all of us in the Apollo unit, good night and goodbye. So there's some wonderful, wonderful insight into one of the Apollo space missions anyway. We will cover others maybe in other podcasts in 2024 if people want us to. But we'll finish with something slightly more light-hearted, also from a missing show. This is Britain's first moonshot from Sykes and the Big Big Show from the 2nd of April 1971. Oh, three, two, one, zero. We have ignition. We have to have a mistle. We have a bird at 20 hundred hours. Greenwich Mean Time. Well, that was the 
good send-off for the show, wasn't it? <laughs> and I wonder how many of you thought that we were in that rocket. <laughs> Even Eric wouldn't be foolhardy enough to do a show from one of those. Excuse me. Hello. Eric, where are you? What do you mean, guess? <laughs> oh, all right. Are you at Mrs. Butterworth? Eric, I can't stand here all day playing guessing games with you. Where are you? <laughs> Hello, I, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a clue. Clue number one coming up, right? Steady, <laughs> you're dumb about the world. <laughs> you're in the post office tower? <laughs> no, no, clue number two. All systems are go. To those prunes, I warned you. <laughs> You're in the doctors. No, I'm not. I'll tell you what. Look, as I gaze out of my window, I can see Africa, India, Jamaica. Are you in Paddington? <laughs> <laughs> She'll never get it. Listen, I'll give it to you. You know that rocket that went up just before the show? Yes. Well, I'm in it. Eric, if you don't get round here right away, that may very well be the case. Ha! Look, you've got a television set on the stage, have you not? Yes. Would you switch it on, please? He's never up in a rocket. Make him giddy if he gets on a chair. <gasps> Eric! I can see you! Who moved to in bed with you? <laughs> <laughs> We're not in bed. You have to lie like this. It's one of the rules. You know the Russian rocket Vostok, the American rocket Apollo 13? Well, this is Britain's answer. Manchester 1. Manchester 1. And Eric is there. When in all the world laughed and twisted the lion's tail, one man stood firm. Eric dedicated burning with a patriotic fervor. Here was Eric for Christy, Ashington, Baron's Robert, Dunkirk, and Eric in Manchester. As long as there are Britons, there will be Eric, for it is about Eric was a pinjo, and the son George. <laughs> he isn't really in the rocket, but I rather like that speech. <laughs> On behalf of everybody at Kaleidoscope and also on behalf of myself and Naresh and Tristan, we all are offer you a, a season's greetings, a happy new year for 2024. May God bring all your blessings to fruition. If they're good things you're asking for, at least. Amen to that. Good night. 